مساء الخير على الحضور جميعا يعني انا برحب بيكم في جلسه النقاش اللي بتنظمها مبادره الاصلاح العربي واوكفام عن موضوع شديد الاهميه وحال جدا في المنطقه هو كيفيه الخروج من فخ التقشف والديون في الشرق الاوسط وشمال افريقيا و محاربة اللامساواة في صلب تعافي من الأزمة الحالية. المتحدثين معنا الأستاذة سلمى حسين وهي باحثة مصرية في الاقتصاد والصحفية. هيمي أتيانزا وهو مسؤول سياسات الديون في مؤسسة منظمة أوكفام والأستاذ محمد زبيب صحفي اقتصادي لبناني انضم إلينا هو بيحاول منطقة الشرق الأوسط واحدة من المناطق اللي بتعاني من معدلات دين مرتفعة وكمان المعدلات دي بتتفاقم بسرعه بسرعه شديده خلال كام سنه اللي فاتوا و ضمن سياق عالمي في تفاقم في الدين العام عموما بسبب وباء كوفيد 19 خلال السنه اللي فاتت و شهر اللي مضى من 2021 وده خلى يعني الانفاق الحكومي يزيد ومعدلات العجز والديون تزيد. القضيه دي اصبحت قضيه شديده الاهميه وشفنا اوضاع زي الموجوده في بلد زي لبنان انه الازمه الدين اصبحت ازمه شديده الوطأ على بس على الوزن العامه لكن على كافه اشكال الحياه الاقتصاديه. Jamie, can, can you give us a, a, a picture on the world level, um, the debt indebtedness that uh, as a problem that is facing all countries uh, at, at the moment? Hello, everyone, and thanks very much for, for this kind invitation. Uh, as Oxfam, we are, we are very happy to organize and we are very happy to participate in such a dialogue, which we consider to be critical because we are in an age of inequality and uh, this COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated inequalities and debt is playing a critical role. Before we had fallen into this new crisis period, we had already the highest levels of debt in all range of countries throughout the world. So we were in a new, in a new setting. We were seeing that the higher income countries were using debt massively um, and, uh, and relying less on taxes. This was a result of uh, a certain trend to lower tax collection and to free up uh, money out of wealth and of capital. Then we had all these digital businesses that are the new uh, economic giants of our time and particularly these kind of uh, companies are, are especially uh, good at not paying the right amount of taxes. So we have economic giants and we have a context in which they are not paying enough money. So they are making trillions and these trillions are flooding the whole world through uh, investment funds and new debt creating instruments. As a result, uh, it's easier for governments to take that money and use those loans, even if sometimes for some countries it is expensive, but for others it's not, and uh, than to uh, raise taxes and try to create uh, a fair society in a more uh, comprehensive way. So as a result, we have a world with high debts. We have all these trends of wealth concentration, low taxation, and even tax competition that we need to really counter if we want to enter a new era. And of course, as we look at the world, uh, once the pandemic has hit, what we are seeing is that for developing countries, it's a much tougher picture. Uh, when looking back at the IMF uh, 
fiscal monitor where they look at what countries are investing in their own recovery, in protecting the people in their countries. What we see is that high income countries have been have committed to invest 10% of their uh, GDP, of their national wealth, that emerging middle income countries have committed to invest 3%, so that's three times less, and that low income countries can only use 1.5%. As a result, there was an inequality at the beginning, and now we have a new inequality because countries cannot invest in their own recovery and cannot incur in new debt because they already have a debt problem. And this is, I think, how I would uh, express the, the, the big picture on where things stand at this, at this moment without looking at any specific group of countries. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. The, the Arab world is not an exception from the general situation, the general state and the harmony, if you will, between high debt rate and inequality. Talma, can you provide us with a picture about the a link between these two in Egypt? Yes, of course. As Jaime explained, the situation here is the same. Uh, inequality feeds into debt and vice versa. This is a vicious circle that uh, prevails up until this day and which is, by the way, exacerbating by the day in an exponential manner. With regard to inequality in Egypt, we are among the top 10 countries when it comes to inequality of wealth. Uh, so this wealth this wealth inequality stabilized at some point. However, the general level of inequality wealth increased over the past few years and erosion of the middle class accompanied the process, of course. And so the situation today is that even if data in Egypt does not show income inequality to its full extent, however, we can say that the wealthiest 1% own the equivalent of uh, uh, what is owned by the poorest 18% when it comes to income. And so, so I meant to say that half of society has an income equivalent to the 1%. So we have a severe case of inequality, as you can see. And so this picture I'm painting is not a stable one. It is constantly evolving. And what I'm describing today is the result and outcome of a number of policies over the years. These policies accelerated over the past decade, particularly after the agreement that we signed with the IMF around 2016. It led to an exacerbation of uh, this downward sli uh, slide, which led to an, an exponential increase of wealth for a number of individuals, or at least uh, protecting them from losing their wealth. Thank you very much, Salma. I'm not sure whether Mohammed Zbib has joined us. Uh, he, he joined and then left once again, apparently. I wanted to point out that uh, those who require interpretation whether arabic or english can choose the adequate channel there is a sign on the bottom of the screen that says interpretation and uh, zoom participants unfortunately uh, our facebook audience cannot uh, afford these translation options however zoom participants can use arabic or english uh, translation so i can speak briefly about the situation in Lebanon. In Lebanon, uh, obviously the economic situation has worsened significantly and the most recent and updated studies of inequality in the Arab world undertaken by uh, Thomas Piketty and his team place Lebanon, perhaps because it is the only uh, country which included certain tax studies so it placed lebanon uh, among the top ranking countries in terms of inequality mohammed zbib it seems has joined us 
Hello. It is good that I am able to join you. However, it seems I am having a technical problem, says Muhammad Zbib. I apologize for this delay. No problem, says Wael. I was actually talking about Lebanon, saying that Lebanon ranks amongst the highest, or uh, it is the top-ranking country in terms of inequality, according to the studies by Piketty and his team. And according to the updated studies that are based on tax uh, information, uh, in addition to the fact that Lebanon has been suffering from a crippling economic crisis uh, for the past year plus. So can you talk to us about this uh, 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 link between inequality and uh, debt, as is the case in Lebanon? Well, we can base our discussion on a very important subject the lebanese model when it comes to the accumulation of debt uh, highlighted uh, debt as a tool for reverse distribution so from the lowest income brackets to the highest income brackets we can talk at length about the indicators the facts and attribute them to several theories in order to uh, corroborate that however i will only mention two indicators just to clarify my idea uh, the a general history of Lebanon in terms of government debt is not a long one. So actually, Lebanese public debt began in the early 90s with the end of the civil war, the Lebanese civil war, and the launching of the reconstruction project. And so it is easy to trace it historically. In the early 1990s, public public debt in Lebanon did not exceed the $3 billion. And it was all in Lebanese pounds. So it was an in domestic debt. And since that moment up until today, public debt, government public debt, has now exceeded the $100 billion. And if we take that indicator into account in order to try to gauge or measure its impact on the public budget, for example, we see that throughout this period, this last, uh, uh, these last few dec decades, public debt service, which is the paid interest from the public budget, it constitutes 50% of the government's income, the government's returns over these years. And so the interests paid through the budget constitute more than a third of public spending. And so if we want to simplify this process as much as possible, we can safely say that every uh, US dollar or Lebanese pound paid in the form of tax to the public budget, half of those would go to creditors and the other half would go to the other state functions, including public spending, investment spending and others. The interests item in the budget throughout this period constituted the biggest item when it comes to public spending. And if we want to highlight another indicator in order to understand the acceleration of government debt, it is important to note that the uh, total of interests was around 85 billion dollars meaning very simply put that public debt was actually fed by itself to itself which means that that service was one of the main reasons for the increase in public debt in lebanon and so this debt had no clear function when it comes to the management of socio-economic policies in the countries, but rather an obvious mechanism for reverse redistribution, which resulted in a huge increase. <clears throat> it seems we have lost the speaker.
يعني It seems, says Mr. Jamal, that Muhammad is no longer with us. However, what he was saying about the state of debt and debt as a way to reproduce uh, inequality. Latin America and, and, and now Africa is going through the same scenario of very high inequality uh, rates and especially Latin America, because they they have gone through this process um, uh, decades ago. What can we learn from that? And and how the international institutions played the role in, in the problem and provided that they're now trying to deal or saying that they're trying to deal with the uh, debt problem. I think if, if it's okay, I can try and answer uh, or provide with some answers. It's a pity that we, we couldn't get the full story of, of Lebanon. It definitely looks very similar to other countries where what we are seeing now is that it's a big chunk of their public budget that's being used for debt repayments, basically. And there are less taxes or less revenues, lower revenues than we've seen in past years. What we are seeing as a result of COVID-19 is that revenues have fallen uh, between 4 and 5% of GDP, and that normally means it's between 20 and 40% of actual revenue. That's a massive hit, and what uh, they had, the richest countries have done is try to put in new money using their central banks and other mechanisms, uh, but other countries don't have access to these mechanisms. So debt in those countries acts as a trap and uh, does not allow countries to, to confront the troubles. What we can say we, we have learned from previous crises in Latin American countries and in other regions, uh, the first thing to say, uh, and, and it's, uh, it's not a good thing, is that it took very long to take action. And it took very long to take action because what we saw is creditors first protecting their own interests and their own assets. and. Uh, and pulling back so that they could use the time to recover while countries kept paying. Uh, if you imagine this uh, projected to Egypt or Lebanon means uh, very high payments for a number of years and uh, not restructuring until uh, the creditors have cashed enough so, so they can uh, be in a, at a stable position. And that's the first lesson. We need to be, to be pushing for early restructuring when there's no other way out than treating the debts, getting some debt reduction or debt restructuring, uh, delaying these situations is only on the advantage of creditors and is um, in the detriment of the people of the country. So that's a first lesson. Uh, the second lesson for me is that uh, long austerity suffering does not bring a happy end. And that we saw very clearly in the old crisis, debt crisis in Latin America, because it took over eight or nine years to come to a point where there was an attempted solution. So we cannot wait eight or nine years. Countries in crisis, if countries spend nine years in crisis, it's the suffering of the people and there are all kinds of impacts. That's a second lesson. And uh, it has been learned to a point and uh, we have seen now that the, the new uh, speaking of even of the IMF or the World Bank is no to austerity, we need to increase uh, investment, spend as much as you can, has said Kristalina Georgieva, but we need to be careful because uh, when we looked at the, at the papers, at the concrete uh, agreements, you see that uh, austerity or public cuts are underlying in future agreements. So that's a second, that's a, an important second lesson. Uh, austerity has not brought good uh, results in the past. So we need uh, debt restructuring and we need new financing and debt relief happening at, uh, at the same time with different mechanisms. If we look at what is going on in Africa now, and I mentioned this in Sub-Saharan Africa because it's mainly in that region that action has been taken. So last year there was a G20 initial agreement to at least temporarily suspend one portion of those debts. That would be a path to follow. Only we need uh, that the suspension should be universal of all debts, so no payments happening so that countries can use the money in their coffers for their own recovery. 
and we can figure out what happens afterwards next. But we are going to need, because the crisis is so deep, we are going to need cancellation uh, of the payments due in certain years. Uh, we heard some African leaders talk about uh, three or four years. That was the same we were saying from civil society actors and some experts. I think uh, we have only gotten that far still. So G20 did not respond it, uh, was still somehow protecting private creditors' interests that have not uh, joined any kind of initiative. And 2021 should be a year where this happens. But for the moment, middle-income countries are not being included in debt relief measures. And that's a critical point for, for the MENA region. Uh, the region is not alone. We've seen this past year, Argentina and Ecuador in Latin America uh, dealing with debt and, uh, and uh, having agreements that meant uh, de facto debt cancellation of up to 50%. And that is a, a good precedent, but we need this to happen in a, in a more general way. And that is something that uh, the region could be trying to learn from and could be trying to gain uh, support uh, from, from those experiences. And I have to say that uh, I want to mention that uh, Argentina, besides uh, gaining this debt restructuring, that was a hard process uh, and that allowed them to stop paying for two or three years so that they could go for recovery. That's good. What happens next, we don't know, but at least that fiscal space is critical. They also decided to put in place a wealth tax. And that's quite innovative and that's quite important because what we have seen these days is that um, the biggest billionaires in the world are making trillions. And uh, with those trillions, we could pay for the vaccine for everyone and the recovery for everyone. but those are not in public pockets, they are in private pockets. And we also saw, and I have to mention this, my colleagues in the, in the MENA region developed the Oxfam report for the region, and they had some, some shocking numbers. Uh, 21 billionaires increased only since the pandemic hit in March, their wealth in over 10 billion, and that should be uh, enough to rebuild twice Beirut after the explosion, and that's quite a shocking number. So going for those, for taxation uh, of wealth is also a, a path that we can learn from, but we can also build uh, for the future. Thank you, Jamie. Jamie, can I point to the Jamie pointed out the contradiction in the policies of the IMF through the agreements whereby they provide recommendations to increase spending as a means to revive the economy, while at the same time including a number of items in these policies that call for austerity. And this is the case uh, for Egypt, for example. Egypt is one of the prominent uh, partners with the IMF when it comes to these uh, uh, agreements and we can see very clearly how austerity uh, affected this process in Egypt. Uh, listening to Jaime, uh, uh, there was an agreement with the IMF to repay the debt over the uh, coming year and a number of items were included in the agreement on the assistant package for coronavirus, for example, which would be produced by the budget, which is equivalent to the returns by the government. And so that over the coming year, we will be immediately resuming our austerity measures. However, by following up on the situation in Egypt, I wanted to point out something that is happening in Egypt, which I'd like to call selective austerity. Uh, we, we always accompany borrowing with a reduction of public spending as a requirement by creditors. However, I am seeing that this is happening selectively because in fact, we still uh, are 
in debt and yes public spending is reduced for uh, certain things however there are still uh, a number of generous transfers from the public budget to some of the big investors and the big companies even major employees in the state don't even suffer from this austerity while teachers doctors and nurses suffer from the measures of austerity F for example egypt's uh, self-sufficiency in 2015 mentioned a uh, a wage ceiling and uh, the egyptian government made reductions much bigger than those required i believe by the imf and at the same time we knew very well that some of the biggest employees in egypt uh, are not paid from the public budget but rather funds outside of the public budget and so we're saying that millions of government employees uh, including doctors teachers judges and other public service providers suffered from austerity while some of the uh, highest level employees uh, ministers and up actually maintained the largest part of their income without any effects of austerity this is the selective austerity that i have been noticing another example is for example uh, subsidies during uh, coronavirus uh, food subsidies uh, over the past year was actually were actually reduced by the government uh, for this year without even taking inflation into account so it was reduced greatly by the government by about four billion egyptian pounds and at the same time it decided to provide support to government institutions that are not named by the public budget without giving any reason for doing so so uh, they increased these uh, spend uh, these expenditures four times so we're talking about not only the fact that that yes, there is austerity. There is also selective austerity, where, whereby some people have maintained a status quo, and that is due to the public spending, which increases year after year. And we borrow to maintain that public spending and increase it uh, to the point where where we pay public debt service. Uh, Egypt has the highest level of uh, actual or real uh, interest rates 60 percent of our loans are short-term loans for about three four nine months and so most of this debt must be repaid very quickly with very high interest rates and this puts us as mr zavib saying uh, in a position similar to lebanon's it puts us in a, in a position uh, similar to lebanon whereby half of the public spending is used on uh, debt service or debt interests so we're talking about amounts uh, reaching the trillions of Egyptian pounds that are spent on that. Thank you very much, Salma. I believe that the option of austerity policies is uh, is on the table in Lebanon, similarly to, to Egypt, whether it has been proposed by the IMF representatives or politicians in Lebanon as a solution to an impossible crisis that has crippled the country for over a year so is there a way is there a different way an alternative for austerity that can be put on the table in order to find a solution to the problem in lebanon mr mohammed uh, one of the participants mentioned taxes is there a place for taxes in this alternative route that can be taken taxes that contribute to the solution of the problem while also helps deal with inequality allow me well first and foremost to point out the fact that the internet problems we're having are one of the effects of austerity that has been in place in lebanon for many years the issue of austerity in lebanon was not suggested merely as a result of the multifaceted uh, uh, crises faced by the lebanese economy and the political system now actually 
austerity policies have been adopted by the Lebanese state in the field of public investments since 1998, whereby the country has a veritable problem when it comes to infrastructure, equipment and preparations at all levels. Uh, those outside of Lebanon must know very well that Lebanon is facing a humongous crisis in providing uh, power and electric energy to an acceptable extent. And to that end, uh, we have private generators that are spread all over our neighborhoods and villages. And this incurs very high costs, uh, environmentally, health-wise, and even when it comes to the trade balance through our very high exportation fee for oil, for example, uh, to activate these generators. And we also lack an effective transportation system within cities and between them. Lebanon also suffers huge problems when it comes to the water supply and water grid, particularly clean drinking water, whereby most Lebanese resort to the private sector in order to secure uh, and uh, the amounts they need in terms of drinking water with a severe lack in uh, road infrastructure, road equipment, public facilities, sanitation, and otherwise. And so the reconstruction phase that Lebanon witnessed uh, in the early 1990s culminated in a blatant failure with the establishment of an economic model that is highly reliant on the importation of US dollars, particularly uh, Lebanese expat remittances and foreign debt, including the deposits of non-residents in order to activate the economic cycle and both public and private spending. And so this all of this contributed to the creation of a model that is highly financed by debts. And here I am referring to the um, general concept, the broad, broader concept of um, debts, not only the government debts. And so in Lebanon, in light of the banking fall, the fall of the banking system, we have discovered some scary numbers about losses and uh, commitments to be paid and as i mentioned in my first intervention around 100 billion dollars in debt uh, suffered by the government with a similar equivalent value in terms of commitments that the central bank has to fulfill around 70 to 80 billion dollars of which are in foreign currency while uh, there is also $21 billion in debt for Lebanese households and, and these debts consume around 50% of the income available to these households and this is according to the 2018 numbers. Today the situation is much more dangerous than it has ever been of course. There are also debts on the private sector which are equivalent to 100% of the GDP and that is according to 2018 statistics. And today we cannot even calculate or make the new cash calculations due to the fluctuation of the exchange rate and thus the lack of a of an equation through which we can completely understand how these numbers are increasing or evolving and the consequences that will result from that on the socio-economic and political infrastructure in the country so in Lebanon, as I said, we're facing a multitude of crises with a number of aspects. The political sphere is uh, complex to a high extent, which has become known by all. The banking system has uh, fallen apart completely. And here, uh, I would like to point out that perhaps Lebanon has registered the biggest banking system fall in history, whereby around 170 billion dollars in deposits in Lebanese banks 
remain of an unknown fate. And as I mentioned, well, more than one year after the fall of the banking system up until now, uh, we have no suggestions or policies, draft policies to deal with that situation. Things are left to exacerbate without any veritable intervention by any party or stakeholder, whether in Lebanon or abroad, in order to put forth a roadmap that helps us understand how to transition from this phase to a new phase. So the situation in Lebanon can be characterized by a very high level of risk and danger. And I say that knowing that this also has huge social consequences. And this is according to the latest estimates issued by the ESQA about some uh, calculations about poverty rates in Lebanon. So that today, around 55% of Lebanese households live under the poverty line. 25% of the population approximately suffers from extreme poverty. They are under the lowest poverty thre threshold, excuse me. These numbers by the ESQA are actually taken from the pre-COVID-19 era, which means that things today are naturally much worse. According to the uh, Central Statistics study for the years 2018-2019 about the livelihoods of the household and the workforce, in 2018, 72% of households had an income lower than 1,000 six hundred dollars and so with the decrease of the exchange rate and a loss of more than 80 percent of the lbp value we can easily surmise that three quarters of households live with less than 250 dollars per month so less than the minimum wage in dollar uh, in 2018, which was $450, according to the rate at the time. And then COVID-19 uh, ravaged Lebanon and made things worse and led to a state of confusion and completely arbitrary handling of such a huge healthcare crisis, which led to successive chaotic lockdowns. <laughs> Which, which was embodied by a number of reactionary hysterical measures that resulted in a number of lockdowns and the faltering of several economic institutions and thus more uh, cases of uh, firing of employees and thus higher levels of unemployment, poverty, uh, food deprivation livelihood deprivation, etc. So we're talking about a an all-out crisis that affects all the aspects and various components of the political and socio-economic system in the country. And all of this can be uh, linked to the very title of our discussion, austerity and debt. Debt in Lebanon, as you described, the mountains of debt accumulating for the government, the central bank, and Lebanese households as a whole. The way, so this was the way in which the Lebanese community was subjugated for over 30 years as a result of this debt. And this crippled the very vitality of our community and its ability to avoid more uh, crises and consequences, which forced our community to incur huge losses that would be very hard to make up for in a traditional manner or conventional thought. So today, these discussions are no longer possible in Lebanon. Discussions about uh, austerity that had been made for years, about reduction of interest rates and uh, adopting monetary policies. Today, there are no prospects or hopes in Lebanon in 
under the current economic and political system. Mohammed, very well. Thank you very much. I would like to listen to Jaime to hear his opinion about uh, some opportunities to uh, exit these crises, and then we will go back to you and Salma. So, Jaime. Is there something we can learn from Latin America to draw an alternative path out to break from this uh, circle of debt and austerity we, we are seeing now in, in the MENA region? Well, I think definitely there's, there are lessons to be taken from other geographies because we've seen a uh, crisis happening uh, over the years and in different periods. And we've seen what has uh, helped countries out of those crises and what hasn't. And as I was um, saying before, uh, dealing with the debt problems instead of postponing how to uh, treat debts and trying to get new loans to keep paying uh, when, when you have already an overhang is an important uh, is an important part of the deal. So um, calling on creditors, uh, exposing the difficult situation of the national accounts, and saying we need to we need a halt and we need to renegotiate is going to be important. Uh, normally, when you look at the numbers, uh, the IMF can be an ally in that mission, saying that looking at the numbers and looking at their own assessment on where debt stands, there is a need for restructuring. If we look at what happened this, this uh, last year, 2020, uh, it was important for Argentina and for Ecuador in their negotiation with creditors that they had the report of the IMF saying, our debt is unsustainable. And, and that assessment, uh, it's a trigger to start a negotiation. So uh, trying to take the necessary steps and a civil society telling our governments, uh, you don't have to keep rolling and rolling and uh, cutting and cutting our budgets. Let's expose what the situation is and go for measures. I think that's one of the first steps. As I mentioned earlier, I think uh, otherwise you may be waiting during long periods, waiting for years until something is done. And during those years, you'll keep paying out the scarce reserves you have and not serving the rights of your people. So I think that's- And, 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 and what about the finance problem? If, if you're going through this kind of restructuring uh, process, there are financial needs. How can you cover this? So the, that's, that's the other side of the coin. That's what makes uh, today's crisis a really difficult one because you need to restructure and you need um, debt relief, so-called debt relief, but at the same time, you need new financing. So you need, you need both. How can you... How can you uh, make these two compatible? Well, the ways in which this can happen is uh, resourcing to international institutions that have the mandate of providing with some of those resources. And there again, it's difficult uh, to, to uh, escape from uh, having to uh, request the kind of emergency loans the IMF has provided this year. But what we can say is there are others that should be providing loan, uh, sorry, grants so you need to get grant money for certain purposes. And there are only certain purposes that you can fund with that kind of grant money. But there are also other financing modalities that uh, development banks and other uh, countries can provide. Uh, and this can be very long-term financing, very soft loans with long grace periods. So allowing the country to take in new resources that will have to that will benefit from grace periods of, for example, five years, would allow to recover reserves, uh, provide services to the people while you are restructuring your debt and getting into this new period. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult environment, but it can, it can be done. And I think this is one of the things that we have to demand at the global level and at the global arena. We have to demand, and this is one of the key things we are hearing, that there is a new SDR issuance. Uh, that it seems like a technicality. SDRs is the hard currency of the IMF, 
we don't have to forget that the IMF is basically a central bank of the world. So when you don't have a national central bank that can issue new money without impacting your own economy, uh, this is the kind of resource that is needed. And at this moment, I was participating this, mo this morning in a meeting of, uh, with the G20 uh, Italian uh, uh, head of uh, the finance ministry delegation and the talk about an issuance of special drawing rights uh, is under discussion and should probably be happening this year. It was blocked by the Trump administration during the last year, but now there appears to be an, open, an opening for this. And this would mean uh, an injection of reserves in each of the central banks of all the countries. And then it's up to civil society also, and we are pressing in that direction to allow uh, for some of those new, some of that new money that will be allocated on member countries uh, that don't need it or because they have uh, big central banks and they can use their own to be transferred to other countries. So a new SDR issuance to support the financial efforts of countries is one of the big things that should be under negotiation alongside debt relief and debt deals. Right. Uh يعني طبعا قضية تمويل قضية مهمة و يعني احنا هل احنا فقط Financing is a very important topic and Salma Today are we only faced with the idea of relying on international institutions and negotiations which of course are very important in light of some of the crippling crises, crises that several countries are facing, such as Lebanon. Are there domestic internal measures, such as a change in the pattern of policies that are required to deal with debt, while at the same time dealing with inequality that results from this debt? Do you see that taxes are part of these uh, policies? As much as I have a ready answer for such questions, I am reconsidering all of my answers to these questions. As I mentioned about inequality, this inequality was the product of uh, policies. Uh, how do we provide uh, subsidized land uh, to 1% uh, of investors, for, for example, who get 90% of banking loans or even energy subsidies, which are very uh, generous? <clears throat> so this subsidy is in large part given to a small group of tourism and uh, monopolistic uh, industries in the country. And so naturally, yes, there are policies that can help reduce inequality once we reverse them. And uh, they provide us with a margin of maneuvering. However, as Jaime mentioned, we are at a point uh, whereby we rely on the vicious cycle of debt. As the colleague mentioned uh, from Lebanon, public debt service is too high and cannot be, uh, and, and, and is inescapable. And so wherever we need uh, financial assistance, we need to reconsider the debts that we're repaying. And I know that uh, that uh, perhaps the solutions that would work for Lebanon would not work for me or Ecuador. However, there are some general guidelines and uh, these guidelines will not given to us by the IMF. I have been monitoring work with the IMF for over four years and uh, they do not do as they say at the IMF, which is truly worrying. As if there is a hypocrisy that is inherent to the way they deal with things. They absorb the claims and demands by various peoples and movements in the world. They brandish them as a signs that are actually hollow. They actually brandish them as titles and signs while doing the exact opposite. So I cannot imagine that any fund would help us restructure that which falls in favor of the peoples. This, this should be done by the people. Uh, people must be very aware of the fact that that the coming uh, period will witness a restructuring of the debt. However, it should not be similar to what happened before, particularly the 2008 crisis, whereby we as a people would uh, conduct a second bailout of the banks, which actually had provided us with uh, debt. So 
after years of austerity, the world as a whole has been suffering from what the United Nations call a lost decade. In the 2008 crisis, the interests of a, of a number of segments of society were ignored in the favor of a minority. So we are perhaps at the brink of another lost decade. The situation is truly scary. What we saw in the US uh, compared to what we saw in Algeria, um, Tunisia a month ago. So all of these are signs of a dire warning so that when we want to restructure the debt, we should not think that we that we will pay interests to these people. These people must uh, bear a huge burden of the restructuring. Otherwise, we would be discussing more and more austerity, which will be even more destructive to us. Very well. I would like to go back to uh, Mohammed Zibil. The situation in Egypt and Tunisia is difficult. However, it is even harder in Lebanon and people have taken to the streets to protest and demand their socioeconomic rights and that they should not bear the burden of the crisis. Is there a way under this very difficult situation? Is there a way out in your opinion? which does not uh, force people to bear the brunt of the crisis. There's also a question by Nabil Abdo to yourself as well, whether this proposed solution is more debt. So is it possible to avoid more debts knowing that there is a dire need for emergency handling of the situation and how to what extent can this exacerbate inequality uh, in my previous intervention well i wanted to tackle this question from a very defined angle in my opinion the lebanese situation as is in tunisia and egypt the discussion should not be a technical one meaning that it should not be purely economic. We are specifically talking about the political and social economies in the sense saying, are there other ways? Yes, of course, we can say that there are always other ways besides the uh, methods that have been adopted time and time again and which have been proven to fail and result in turn to a number of crises that we're facing under different titles and in different forms. However, all of these crises, in my opinion, can be summarized by the uh, crisis of capitalism as the domineering production model in the world. Some are raising these questions and making discussions in the world from the angle that neoliberalism, excessive neoliberalism, has resulted in the situation today. However, actually, if we take into account the different global discussions on capitalism, which center on the environmental problem, the problem of inequality, as well as the uh, changes brought upon us by technology, then we cannot imagine in such discussions that the uh, prescriptions emanating from a purely liberal perspective are still applicable today. We cannot imagine that these proposals can be valid today. So if we transition from this global discussion to a domestic one, whether in Lebanon or any other country. Well, in Lebanon, there are talks that the political and the economic systems have fallen. So the discussion today, whether taxes, more borrowing or any other form of solutions in light of the falling apart of these systems is a moot point. It, it is a, an irrelevant discussion to our situation and the country, really, because, for example, today, 
in the fight against COVID-19, the Lebanese state has resorted to central uh, to World Bank loans, and up until today, in this year, in this month alone, it announced two loans amounting to more than $280 million in order to combat the consequences and repercussions of COVID-19. And so moving forward and continuing this arbitrary process under the circumstances that we're facing in Lebanon will only mean that we're exacerbating and increasing the volume of losses, costs, and tragedies that will affect our people much more so than expected. And so today, we need a new political project in Lebanon and perhaps in any other country that suffers from similar problems as ours. And by political project, I mean working to find a new social contract that puts all cards on the table for discussion and debate and distributes sacrifices equally to gains according to the social con social contract and if you ask me i believe that in lebanon we cannot overcome the fact that we need the two radical processes when it comes to redistribution one redistribution of previously accumulated wealth within a very small group of oligarchs in the uh, lebanese community which has taken which has dominated all of the assets and gains in favor of their personal interests and gaze and have taken over uh, the uh, collective income of our community so we cannot overcome this crisis while overlooking the, this previously acquired wealth the redistribution of previously accumulated wealth must be the portal uh, the starting point of this political change and after that the social contract must be essentially based on the latent redistribution process so uh, the gains that will result from the reconstruction of the political system and the reconsideration of the very essence of our economy and thus redistribution and so taxes are not a goal in and of themselves they are not the solution however inevitably they are on the table of negotiations as part of a broader discussion of our social contract which very specifically determines how every social and political and economic class contributes to the bearing of the responsibility and the burden however for this social contract to materialize and achieve this miracle of sorts we cannot remain subjugated and accepting of the ideologies uh, of anti-state or state hating and and here i would like to say that i am not particularly friendly to our state however in order to overcome our crisis we cannot fathom or imagine any way that does not go through state interventions a decisive definitive intervention on three levels at least one the provision of social protection on a very broad scale through some of the fundamental rights that must be upheld and protected for all residents of lebanon and here i am mainly referring to universal health coverage free decent education for all and the right of habitat for acceptable fees that are in line with the income level of Lebanese residents or non-Lebanese residents as well as the right to basic income and the right to labor under just and fair conditions and circumstances for the working force the second level of state intervention would be the following for the economy to transition from the phase that it has been in a long-term phase whereby this economy relied on 
our addiction of foreign currency influx so the transition from that to a productive strategy that is reliant on some of the huge potential and possibilities that we have in our society. This is why the state's role would be decisive in equipping our infrastructure uh, e and economic planning in the direction of uh, private uh, capitals to the places whereby they contribute to our economy and the third level of state intervention would have to do with our relations with the, the international community no country can escape or overcome a crisis that it is suffering as ours while acting the whole time as if the international community is a decisive factor in our domestic uh, decisions. Sovereignty and borders is, are not a merely political or security or military uh, topic. It also has to do with the control of the border and movement across the border. And this is where the state should play a very prominent role in imposing controls on capital movement, which guarantees that the product and GDP as a whole of our community does not leak out in any form unless it actually serves the reconstruction and recovery process. Thank you very much, Muhammad. Referred to as the, the issue of the international community and that and and the, the issue of uh, sovereignty uh, national sovereignty the, the 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 power to take decisions concerning your citizens and uh, in 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 a in a situation where where a country is indebted and heavily indebted uh, always comes the question the, the, the possibility of uh, dropping debt and we have seen um, uh, in ecuador in, in 2007, I think, um, an experience of debt audit followed by uh, uh, dropping debt. Is that a possible um, uh, route for Lebanon, uh, Hemi? Well, I, th I think that is a great question. And I have to say that uh, I hear very strongly uh, what Mohammed and Salma are saying about how people need to take uh, their own power and have to build up their capacity to understand what the whole economic and financial situation is because there's a responsibility, uh, I think as uh, voices in civil society in informing people about what is happening and what they need to uh, get ready to understand. So understanding how all the financial issues work, who is benefiting from debts, and uh, the fact that in the end, when you take a loan, if it's for a good purpose, that benefits everyone, it can be a good thing, but it's, if it's just to keep paying to a big private uh, particular interest, you are just bailing out a particular section of your society. I think uh, educating and building capacity in our civil society for this is going to be very important in the future because taxation and debt are going to be uh, fundamental topics because we're in a time of, of, of money crunch, if we can say it. There's need for resources, there's scarcity, and there is these big bills on the backs of countries. Um, on the case of Ecuador and how, how that uh, whole operation happened, uh, it's true there, is, there was a debt audit and it was carried on uh, in uh, in a collaboration with civil society actors, and it was an open process. I remember that one very, very well. Uh, and uh, it, it ended up with an announcement of Ecuador letting go and not paying one part of their own debts. And that was, and that happened. And I have to say there was not, there was no immediate punishment or impact. Uh, it's true that there was, there was an upside on the on the whole economic situation of Ecuador. This was 2008, 2009, and it was a period where the prices of oil had rocketed and uh, the, the, 
economy of Ecuador is highly dependent on oil, so suddenly it had its own resources, so it could uh, assume to uh, have a solid base with which to uh, confront an eventual uh, hit by international creditors. But yes, this was this happened, and it doesn't have to happen in the same manner. But definitely, countries can reach a point where there is no other answer than looking at options that will force a restructuring in an accelerated way. Some would call for uh, for uh, for um, for stopping all payments, for declaring a unilateral moratorium, and that would trigger some effects. A civil society. We've been calling for, for some of the existing uh, laws, international laws that uh, really protect creditors uh, to be um, uh, to, to place a waiver on those laws so that in the time of a pandemic, countries can stop paying and there is no chance of being sued in, sued in courts. Because this is normally, these contracts of debt are normally, international debt are normally signed under under UK or US laws, so you need to change those to protect countries. So it's a highly controversial space, but there are options, they have been used, and I think civil society has to uh, push in that direction, uh, looking bluntly at the numbers and at what those numbers are doing to the people and to the way in which those numbers are not allowing for the, uh, the adequate protection that Dr. Zbib was talking about now. Uh, well, how are you going to provide protection if you have to keep paying those huge bills? Uh, well, you can do one or the other, you cannot do both. And, uh, and it's a big question for countries, where, where is the responsibility? And, and those are decisions that uh, it's important for people to understand how they happen so that they can organize and, and, uh, and well, develop new, new uh, ideas. And I think uh, to, to what, uh, uh, Ms. Hussein was saying uh, a while ago, she was saying that we are seeing this uh, whole situation of dealing with international things, but there are national things that need to be rightened uh, so that uh, things can be changed. And I think, again, that's a very important, uh, that's a very important point. And trying to, you cannot solve everything with just uh, requesting international support because international support can end up uh, protecting those that have normally uh, being granted protection instead of those that were not. So we are going to need, or there's going to be a need of changing the priorities on who is going to get protected and who is going to get the services. And that's definitely one of the things that I think uh, should be a big conversation in societies affected by these kinds, these kinds of, uh, of crisis. And, and finally, I want to make a comment because I, I had a question in the chat box uh, asking about what kind of taxes can be used in the kind of emergency period. And again, referring to something my colleagues were mentioning, uh, wealth taxes are uh, taxes that can tax existing wealth. And when there is a big uh, distribution problem, so a, a large inequality problem, that can be a first step. So use uh, tax, wealth taxes to provide with immediate uh, resources to start with concrete policies. I, I mentioned the example of Argentina. We still have to see the results, but the measure was taken. So that's one that can be, that can be um, triggered immediately. And final comment to the question on vaccines and the World Bank providing loans. I'm now saying instead of um, using the loan for social protection, you can use it to buy vaccines. So our position on this whole vaccine uh, nationalistic race that we are seeing where uh, high income countries are buying all the vaccines in the world and, and uh, have enough vaccines or will have enough vaccines as production grows to vaccinate their people three or four times is absolutely uh, unacceptable and needs to be changed. What we are saying as the is that we need uh, these vaccines to be made patent free so that they can be produced in every single country and we don't have this scarcity of vaccines and we can have everyone protected and going back to normal as soon as better. We are calling this the people's vaccine and that's one of the proposals that Oxfam with the UNAIDS and with many leaders around the world are pushing. It's, it's really, I don't know, 
I don't know how, I don't know what words to put to this, but when I see that uh, countries are really betting and paying higher and higher prices on each vaccine to get it uh, uh, faster for their people and competing, Israel competing with the United States and with the United Kingdom because they pay the most, what kind of a world is this in which people are going to get vaccinated out of uh, this just race to make big, big billions in the accounts of, of the companies that are producing vaccines. This is totally unacceptable. And I think that's where we need this global to local connection with these global situations that need to be tackled and worked through uh, with different partners. And well, I think, I, I think I'll leave it there I'm trying to answer some questions and make some points. Um, Thank you. There are a series of questions by a number of uh, participants. I will be raising them. And if you can answer them rather briefly, since we're running out of uh, time, we're close to finishing. If anyone has any questions, do not hesitate to ask. There is a question to Salma by Nabil Abdu. Some are saying that the main problem has to do with foreign debt, that domestic debt is not a problem. Does this apply to Egypt? Whereby domestic debt does not influence inequality similarly to foreign debt? Another question, I believe that was posed to all participants, how how is it possible to politicize debt and put it at the heart of the social struggle or conflict? Uh, this is similar to the Lebanese case, whereby uh, several popular movements have taken place in order to try to reconstruct the social contract. And there is a professor, uh, a question by Professor Mahdi about uh, the informal sector and its effect on the exacerbation of debt. Since informal economic activity in the sector in Lebanon and Egypt uh, is not subject to taxes and perhaps deepens this uh, deficit faced in the country. Salma, go ahead. Well, first of all, when it comes to domestic and foreign debt, recently the boundaries between the two are no longer clear, meaning that there is domestic debt owned by foreigners and there's foreign debt owned by Egyptians uh, that are playing the role of foreigners or expats. They have different nationalities, for example, uh, and such. However, Egypt, for example, 60% uh, of its debt is domestic, and due to the uh, structuring of uh, wealth in Egypt, we can say that 1% through banks and even local banks together, they own 60% of the Egyptian debt. A large portion of that is owned by public sector banks. And so they are much easier to, re to renegotiate with in order to abandon or drop these uh, debts or, uh, or, or at least renegotiate re, uh, them. So there is a large margin for maneuvering when it comes to negotiations, when it comes to domestic debt, because a large portion of that is owned by public banks, government banks. This is one. Two, foreign debt with uh, for countries such as Lebanon and Egypt, which rely greatly on imports for basic uh, uh, materials and raw materials, which was exacerbated by coronavirus, whereby tourism has been paralyzed, remittances have been reduced greatly. Since many jobs are already on the line abroad for many Lebanese and Egyptian expats, and so exports have faltered as well. So all of this means that there's a very severe uh, dollar shortage. So it is not a crisis of bankruptcy, but rather a lack of dollars to repay the debt. And this is why there have been calls for stopping, for ceasing to pay. Uh, and, and here we're not referring to stopping uh, to pay uh, debts, but rather interests. So uh, this can differ from one country to another. Uh, most of our debt is short term, less than a year. And our medium term is about one, four months, one year, three months, one year, four months. This is all of our debt, our public debt. And so 
Freezing the repayment of interests is very important because we have to roll out this process, as Mr. Zvi was saying. And when we say that we need to draw part of the domestic debt, we're saying that that this is a form of wealth redistribution. Uh, what was interesting to us in that uh, context is that public debt in advanced countries, uh, for example, private wealth is six times the public debt. And so in order to, to drop the public debt, you can reduce the, this private wealth by about a fifth. So I believe that our situation is rather similar. It, we need more studies, of course. However, this can be taken into consideration for me even more so than wealth tax. Dropping the public debt will affect wealth redistribution more. Uh, my concern when it comes to, to taxes is that without a, a global international orientation in order or, or, or effort to combat safe havens. For example, in Egypt and Lebanon, we know very well that even with capital control measures, for example, during the revolution in Egypt, there was capital control. However, still money leaked out, uh, money owned by wealthy officials and wealthy individuals. And if we impose taxes upon the wealthy, well, this won't apply to the wealth that has been already taken out of the country, and this is why it would not be effective to a large extent. So I believe that a huge part of the the South-South cooperation in order to drop the debt must go hand in hand with a call, a broad-scale call for combating uh, financial secrecy and tax evasion, which remains a problem. The IMF still works on that and the OECD as well. So I believe that these two things must go hand in hand for us to actually impose taxes on wealthy individuals. Thank you, Salma Muhammad. With regard to putting debt at the heart of the social conflict, with the Lebanese model, which can be applicable throughout the world, this should be based on three main contradictions that we must agree on. The first contradiction we see in Lebanon, and that can be generalized, is that the exacerbation of, rate, of uh, debt, the mountains of debt, were accompanied with claims of lack of financing to conduct investments in social protection and infrastructure as well as the economy. Thus, this brings down the claim of debt exacerbation or the excuse of debt exacerbation. We're supposed to have at least a preliminary agreement that if any debt was acceptable, it should be at the service of the society and public interest. However, if it was not part of this experience. It is a debt that we must rid ourselves of. And I, and, and I would not hesitate one second in the case of Lebanon to say that we need to abstain from paying debts unilaterally. Point or period, excuse me. The other point that we must take stock of is that the Lebanese community was subject for a very long time to the uh, advertisements of banking success and banking wealth, whereby it was considered that the presence of banking assets in Lebanon that are four and a half times the GDP, the size of the GDP, as a banking achievement, a legendary achievement that even counts as a miracle, this is a contradiction that we must clarify, that banking assets were merely the other side of increased uh, borrowing. And so all of this inflation that we saw in the banks witnessed in Lebanon had 
as a main source the mountains of debt that we already suffered from and all of the processes that were linked to these mountains of debt. And so here as well, as I said, we should not pay the public debt and we should not save the banking sector either. This should be a public demand by all in Lebanon that banks that went bankrupt should declare their bankruptcy period without the use of any penny from the public budget to bail out any bank or provide it with means to continue operating as a zombie bank. The third contradiction, which is an opportunity for me to thank you and Salma for uh, translating Thomas Piketty, uh, Capitalism in the 21st Century, which he pointed out under the title R is bigger than G, which means that the uh, true return of the capital is much bigger than economic growth. So R is bigger than G. So in the case of Lebanon and over the past period, we tried to implement this equation to the Lebanese situation. And the result was truly amazing and we must be aware of it. So if we take the final 10 years, the last 10 years period, the average return for uh, debt bonds was 7.1%, while the average GDP growth was less than 1%. And so this huge gap between returns on debt bonds and GDP growth highlight very clearly how these uh, fraudulent mechanisms were put in plants put in place by the ruling elite and the minority in the country which hampered the gdp growth so in that sense you still have 30 seconds mr muhammad unfortunately yes i will conclude by saying the social conflict in lebanon cannot be or cannot ignore the accumulation of wealth process by these oligarchs through the public debt and so we must base our work on these theories of false debt to say that this debt is over it was zeroed period thank you very much Jaime do you have maybe a reaction to the question on the informal economy Yes, I, I have just uh, my last 30 seconds because I know it's we are towards the end and I also need to jump to, to my teaching yeah. now. Uh, I, well, I'd rather uh, stick to a last message I was planning on saying and it's uh, we need to be prepared, uh, trained, conscious and, uh, and uh, ready to, to be organized on financial matters and on debt matters because these are going to be critical in the months and years to come. And we are talking today mainly about Egypt and Lebanon because there is, we, are, we are seeing deep debt crisis and deep social crisis, but that is the case in many other countries. So working uh, as civil society actors, as activists, as uh, professors, and as journalists is going to be essential in this period. So I would, I would just stick to that final message and, uh, and say it's been such a pleasure to be uh, with you and such an honor to be talking with great speakers and, and joining this great audi audience. So thanks very much. And, uh, and I look forward to continue collaborating, thinking and, and figuring out how to push forward to fight debt and, and curb inequality. And that's, I think, the challenge we are all facing. Thank you, Jaime. Shukran gazilan lil Thank you very much, Jaime. And thank you to all of our panelists today, uh, as well as our participants. We also would like to uh, thank the Arab Reform Initiative and Oxfam, as well as the interpreter who has helped us convey some of our ideas from Arabic and English and vice versa, of course. And we thus conclude today's discussion and panel. Thank you very much.